All right, it is 2.05. So hello, Club Med virtual members. I would just like everyone to give a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Dr. Juliette Ray. Dr. Ray is a board certified general surgeon and fellowship trained in colorectal surgery. And we are incredibly grateful for her, uh, this shadowing opportunity and hope to learn a lot today. As a reminder to our Club Med virtual members, if you would like to have your camera on, we highly encourage it as long as you stay on mute while Dr. Ray is talking. Um, there will be a survey given at the end of the session for uh, Wayne State students to obtain shadowing and attendance hours. And just to reiterate, that is for Wayne State students only. Um, we are also recording this session. So anyone watching from YouTube, hello, and thank you for watching. And I'll turn the session over to Dr. Ray. Hi guys. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. And thank you guys for being here. I'm very excited to speak with you today about surgery and my subspecialty colorectal surgery. Um, if you want, like she mentioned, to turn on your cameras, we can make this a little more interactive and, um, and speak together. I see some stuff in the chat. Okay, perfect. So if you have questions too, you can add um, to the chat or you can just unmute and ask and we can go, you know, answer those as we go. All right. Okay, so here's a little outline of what we're gonna talk about today. So first I'll tell you a little bit about me and what it takes to become a surgeon. Um, then I'll tell you what colorectal surgery is because it's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, and then we'll go through a day in the life of a surgical resident. So if you're planning to go to medical school and eventually residency, you'll get a little glimpse into that. And then we'll play a little game called general surgery, true or false and um, then go through a case presentation. So um, I'll leave you with some advice as well to future med students. All right, so um, in terms of my background, um, I am a affiliated assistant professor at University of Miami um, Miller School of Medicine, which is where I did my medical school and my residency actually. So I did seven years of general surgery residency there, as you can see, which was five years of residency plus two clinical research years. So most general surgery residencies now are the five clinical years plus two additional years, some program one additional year. So you're looking at you know basically about seven years of residency. And then I did a one year fellowship at New York University. Um, so you wanna become a surgeon, what does that look like? So as you guys know, you're an undergrad now, most of you, I believe. So you're doing your pre-med requirements, um, taking your MCAT. Eventually you will make it to med school where you'll do another four years. Um, during this time, you'll take your USMLE, which is the boards and that's in three steps. And then you'll enter what's called the match, which is the system for entering residency. So within your specialty, you will apply and rank the programs you want to go to and they will rank you and out comes a match on match day, which you may have heard about. And that's where you'll spend your next um, years, depending on which residency you choose. That can be anywhere from three to eight years. Um, if you choose general surgery, which I hope you do, um, you're looking at five clinical years plus another one to two years of research, like I mentioned. And then during that time, um, you can also pursue a dual degree that's often done during the clinical research years. Um, and for me, I did a master's of science in public health. Um, and then you're looking at your fellowship. So for fellowship in surgery, depending on what you go into, these can be anywhere from one to three years. Mine was one year. Okay, so what is colorectal surgery? So this is a subspecialty of general surgery that focuses on the GI tract. So everything from the small bowel to the large intestine, all the way down to the rectum and anus. So you may wonder, you know, what are we treating? So this is mostly colorectal cancers and anal cancer. So we just finished March, but that was colorectal cancer awareness month. So you may have seen some, um, you know, advertising for that, encouraging people to get screening colonoscopies, looking for um, identifying colon cancer at early stages. Um, diverticular disease is another big one. Um, most people know someone who has suffered from that probably in your parents' age range, but yes, um, diverticulitis and diverticulosis are something that colorectal surgeons treat. And then bowel obstructions, meaning a blockage in the intestine can be due to many things that you see listed there, for example, volvulus, strictures, adhesions, or masses. Um, another uh, particular focus of our field is inflammatory bowel disease. So um, that's Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. I just finished a case, um, like a five hour surgery for Crohn's disease um, uh, this morning. And then anal rectal pathology. So these are kind of like the bread and butter, a little easy things that we deal with on the daily. So things like hemorrhoids, fissures, fistulas, abscesses, pilonidal disease, you've probably heard of those. And then also management of functional disorders. So um, incontinence, constipation, pain syndromes, we work with the GIs or the gastroenterologists to take care of patients with these conditions that are refractory to medical management. All right, so what does a day in the life of a surgery resident look like? I remember when I was in, um, 
when I was in uh, undergrad, I remember that was like, well, I don't want to like tell you how old I am, but that was when Grey's Anatomy was coming out and we would all watch with my sorority, we would all watch Grey's Anatomy and we thought, you know, oh, this must be what residency is like. And to be honest, it's not so, so far off. Um, but this is like a general um, glimpse of what, you know, you're looking at um, in your typical day. So most times you'll wake up around five, sometimes earlier, you'll arrive to the hospital around six, you sign out with the night team and you do what's called pre-rounds, meaning you go um, collect all the information you need for rounds, which is going um, you know, door to door to the patient's room, examining them and trying to figure out what the plan is for the day. Um, that happens usually around 6.30 because everything needs to be done by 7.30, which is the time that most OR cases start. Um, so then around 7.30, you either go to the operating room, do your cases for the day, or um, if you're an intern, you may be doing floor work, which means taking care of patients on the floor and following up on consults in different orders, different uh, wound care kind of things. And then at night, you sign out to the night team who takes over where you left off and repeats that process overnight. So most places, it does kind of work on a shift system like this. So you may have a few weeks of nights and then a few weeks of days. Some places do 24-hour shifts. It kind of depends where you go to residency. And then when you finally get home, you still have to do all things everybody else has to do in the world, right? Eat, work out, sleep, study. So it is long days, but you get used to it and it's definitely worth it. Um, during your residency, uh, obviously the focus is, you know, education. So you have many educational conferences during this time. I listed some there like tumor board, morbidity and mortality, grand rounds, and it really is an amazing learning opportunity. Um, most residencies also still have four weeks of vacation. So you have that to look forward to. Um, and then you do have a yearly board exam called the in-service exam or in-training exam, um, which you take every year of residency. And then when you're done, you have to take the general surgery written boards and oral boards. And that makes you a board certified surgeon once you've completed all those tests. Um, and then I listed there again the research years and fellowship years, which are optional. Does anyone have questions about that? All right, we'll move on. Oops, sorry. All right, so now on to our little game. So I'm gonna need some participation. So you can feel free to enter these in the chats if you don't wanna say anything. So these were some misconceptions I had when I was an undergrad about what a surgeon was. And again, we're referring to someone who thought Gray's Anatomy was like the standard of education about, <laughs> about residency. So um, true or false, you have to be mean to go into surgery and everyone around you is mean too. All right, I'm getting lots of falses. So you're, you're on to me already. But you know, I honestly thought this, like I, you know, I saw those, those lots of people screaming and a lot of stress and all that. So, so this is really, you know, kind of what I thought, um, but this is false. Um, all right, next one. You will have no life as a general surgery resident or attending. Any responses to this one? <laughs> semi-true. I like that. I guess that that's probably a better answer. I didn't have that as an option, but I like semi-true. We'll say, we'll say somewhat or semi-true. I like that. So, so this I would say is false, but it's also what you make of it. So I'm going to give you some examples. This is my wedding, which happened my third year of residency or my first year of my research years of residency. And the other four people in that photo were all of my co-residents from that year. So all of us, you know, had the night off to celebrate my wedding and we were very close and you become close because you're, you know, training together for many, many hours a day, as I showed you in that um that schedule so you do have time to have you know life events um the next picture is me and my two kids that were also born during residency so the bigger one sydney and then the little baby that you see under there is ella so sydney was born during my second year of research and ella was born during my seventh year of residency or my fifth clinical year so totally possible to have a life outside of residency even you know even in residency and of course as an attending when you have a little more control over your schedule so i know some people can be discouraged about going into the sort of um more aggressive fields traditionally but this has definitely changed Okay, residency is brutal and no fun. Any, any answers to that one? All right, false. So yes, this is um, us intern year. So you're definitely working hard. We all fell asleep on the job, but we also have a lot of fun. I put this picture because it's such a nice memory. It was my first big vascular case, a ruptured aortic aneurysm. There's me as the intern and my attendings and my senior resident. Um, and it was just like such a memorable moment because, you know, I finally made it into the operating room to do a big case. So it is a lot of hard work, but also fun and rewarding both in and out of the operating room. All right, here's I think the last one. You should choose surgery if you can't imagine yourself doing anything else. So you should only go into surgery if you really can't, you have no choice. You just want to so bad, there's no other choice for you. 
Yeah, so this one I think is true. And the reason I think it's true is because it is a high stakes field, right? We're dealing with life and death situations. It's very stressful um, and it does kind of affect and encompass your whole life. So although I gave you all those examples of all the wonderful things you can do, you know, be with your friends, have a family if that's what you want. It is, um, you know, a slightly different lifestyle with a much higher level of responsibility than any other specialty in my opinion. So just something to keep in mind. Okay, so actually this I think is the last one. Surgeons do and don't think. This was something that, um, you know, I think a lot of the TV shows and things kind of give you the impression of that surgeons just, you know, someone tells them to cut something out and that's what they do. They don't really do a lot of planning or, um, you know, take care of the patient in any other sort of, you know, medical kind of way. Oh, good, I like the false, okay. So yes, this is false. And I'm gonna show you through some examples, all the planning that goes into surgery. In fact, um, you know, a lot of times students are stressed out or concerned about the technical aspect. Like, can I be a surgeon if I'm left-handed? Can I be a surgeon if I shake, if I have a tremor, if I'm not good with my hands? The technical aspect of surgery is really not the complicated part. It's really the thinking through complicated situations and knowing when to operate and actually when not to operate, when operating might actually hurt the patient. So that is the, you know, I guess, thinking and not doing aspect that is that takes all these years to learn. All right, so how do surgeons work up patients? So you guys have probably done a few shadowing sessions and may have seen people take you through cases, but um, patients with colorectal diagnosis, you know, they present either in the clinic or in an emergency setting. You know, a lot of times we get consults right out of the emergency room, but regardless of how, you know, intense or unstable the patient is, the workup is always the same. And that's what I want you guys to get out of this is you have to go through in a systematic way. So history and physical, labs and imaging, stabilize the patient with the medical management and optimization for surgery. And then you finally get to the surgery and the post-op care. And then of course, as surgeons, we follow up our patients. And as a oncologic surgeon, like a colorectal surgeon, you have to um, surveil them or follow up their you know, cancer screening. So that's a very important part of our practice. All right, so here is the case. So we'll go through this. A 66-year-old woman presents to your office with rectal bleeding. She reports it started about six months ago and it's been worsening. She has no pain, but she's noticed a 10-pound weight loss over the past three months. Oops. All right, so what are you gonna do first? Like we mentioned, we're always gonna take our detailed history, right? We need some more information to figure out what's going on. So we use a lot of mnemonics in medicine because it's a lot to remember. So some mnemonics that um, you know that I find helpful are what we call the sample history, which you see on this side. It reminds us what we need to ask when we go see a patient. So symptoms, allergies, medications, past history, last oral intake, and events leading up to this incident. And then there's um, another mnemonic I like called old carts, and this helps us characterize pain. So for example, if your patient has a new symptom or pain or itching or whatever it is, then you can use these um, these you know types of questions to characterize the pain and help help you narrow down your differential diagnosis. So for example, when did it start? That's the onset. Where is it located? How long does it last? Is it sharp? Is it stabbing? Is it pressure like? Does anything make it better or worse? Does it radiate to other parts of the body? Is there a temporal pattern? Is it worse after they eat, for example, or when they first wake up? And how severe it is on a scale of one to 10? So as you can see, if you keep these things in mind, you'll ask all the important questions. So I'll give you just the, the pertinent things. So she says that there's blood with every bowel movement and has also noticed the stool is thinner and feels like can't get everything out. Um, there's no medications, no allergies, has not seen a doctor in years, never had a colonoscopy or other surgery. A lot of times, you know, it's a little bit difficult because the patient may not know their history like this or may not have followed up. And so you're kind of doing a little detective work. Um, we also get a review of systems, which basically means going head to toe, trying to figure out, um, you know, any other symptoms that may be pertinent, even though the patient didn't bring them up. So on this review of systems, we found that the patient was weak, had fatigue and weight loss. Um, and then she also says that her father and grandfather died of cancer, but she doesn't know what type. So now that you've collected your history, you have all that information in mind. Now you're going to do a full physical exam and see what kind of objective data you can get. So the very first thing we start with when we do a physical exam is called the vital signs. And they're called vital signs because they are literally vital. If <laughs> you can't do anything until you have the vital signs, because you may get the patient's vital signs and find that the patient is unstable, at which point you're not going to spend the next, you know, two hours taking the most detailed history in the world. You've got to act and, you know, stabilize the situation. So these vital signs are actually normal. So that's good. And then we examine the patient and she's a little bit distended or bloated, um, but the belly is soft. It's not firm or peritonitic as we call it. Um, and there's no previous surgical scars, which goes along with her history. 
And then you do what's a, called a DRE, a digital rectal exam. And here we're looking for a mass that we can feel or if there's any blood and there wasn't in this case. Any questions about that so far? All right, so the very first thing you have to ask yourself as a surgeon or a medical student or a resident going to work up a patient with a potential surgical diagnosis is, is the patient stable or unstable? So what do you guys think, stable or unstable? Perfect, stable, yeah, right? The vital signs were stable, the belly exam's not too scary, the patient's talking to you, she's not in extremis. So we're not like rushing to the OR, right? We have some time to figure out what's going on and work up our patient. All right, so what do you wanna do next? If we're worried about a colon problem, usually the first thing we do is a colonoscopy because that gives us a lot of information and we can look inside the bowel and see if there's anything scary in there. So you may not have seen a colonoscopy before, but basically what this involves is a camera or um, that's on a long, you know, thin fiber optic tube here. And we actually look inside the bowel from the inside out. So you, this, you may ask like, how is this different from a CAT scan or an MRI? Well, that shows us more of what's going on on the outside on um, the general appearance of the bowel. But this gives us a look at the actual mucosa of the bowel. And you can see a picture here of what that looks like on the screen that we see. And then within the bowel, we do see this big thing here. What do we think this is? Looks irregular, looks friable, or kind of bloody. Anyone have any guesses of what this is? Yeah, a tumor or colon cancer, right? So how can we figure out, is this a cancer? Is this a benign tumor? What can we do at this point? Yeah, take a sample, exactly, biopsy. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. So just to give you some anatomy in case you haven't seen the colon before, um, the small bowel leads you to here, the terminal ileum. The terminal ileum dumps you into the cecum and that little thing hanging off the cecum is the appendix, you probably all heard of that. Um, then it goes ascending, transverse, descending, sigmoid, because it looks like an S, and then out the rectum, right, to the anus. So, so here is a sigmoid colon and this is where we saw that mass in this region, okay? So we're gonna do exactly that. So we can use our colonoscope with some little biopsy forceps. You can see those coming out of here to take a sample of the tumor. And then anyone know what this is? We're injecting some dye into the bowel wall. Can anyone guess why we're injecting that dye? For CT, that's a good guess. Any other guesses? So eventually when we go to operate on this patient, we want to know where that tumor is, right? Because now we're going to be in the belly looking at the outside of the bowel and we might not necessarily see the inside of the bowel where we saw the tumor before, right? Especially if it's pretty small. So we use tattoo, literally like ink tattoos from to, to tag it in multiple locations around the tumor on the inside so that it goes through the bowel wall and we see it from the outside. Yes, yeah, someone wrote marking, so exactly right. Um, so this is especially important to sort of smaller tumors. So now that we have our biopsy, we know we have a sigmoid colon tumor. We took some pathology. It told us it was adenocarcinoma. Now we have to do staging. So I'm sure all of you guys have heard stage of the cancer, right? Or it's advanced stage, it's early stage. So staging basically refers to two things, the local involvement of the tumor and if there's any distant disease, distant metastatic disease, for example, meaning like a tumor in the mm -hmm. liver that's spread from the colon or in the lungs. So we use CT, chest, abdomen, and pelvis to look across the whole body, and that was negative. So we know we're not stage four because stage four means metastatic. And then we also get a tumor marker called CEA. CEA is pretty cool. Um, it's a it's a lab that you just draw from the blood. And you know when you take that before colon cancer, it's often elevated. And after you take the colon cancer out, it should go down. And in our process of surveillance, the surgeon who follows the patient, you know, over years after their colon is taken out, we keep checking that number. And if that number trends up, then what do you think we're worried about? So it was high before we took the tumor out. We took the tumor out, now it's low, and now it's high again a few years later. What could be going on? All right, I got no guesses, but basically we're worried that it recurred. Um, yeah, or new tumors, exactly. So either the tumor recurred back, you know, maybe the margins weren't negative and it recurred back in the colon, or maybe new tumors popped up in different parts of the body because you're not getting every microscopic tumor cell, right? You're just taking out the gross tumor. So um, that's some, some way that we use to kind of keep track of how the disease is. So now this goes back to the part about surgeons thinking and not doing is now the question comes up, 
do we operate? Can we operate? Should we operate? That's the hardest part about being a surgeon, right? So there's really two main questions we have to ask ourselves in this situation. One is, is it resectable? That means, can we take it out? So for example, if there's a big tumor and it's invading everything and it's terrible, it's invading other vital structures, then we can't, it's not even possible to take that out safely, right? So that's question number one, is it resectable? And question number two is, what are the patient considerations? Is there anything we can do to optimize our patient? Because this is an emergency. Um, what can we do to optimize our patient to make sure that they have the best possible outcome from this? So for example, if the patient smokes or they're malnourished, that is going to give us a whole slew of complications we don't want to deal with if we don't have to. Things like wound infection or bowel leak um, or hernias. So we try to optimize all these things pre-op. The next thing to consider is how emergent it is, how stable is the patient? How severe is the cancer? Can we wait a little bit to get these other things under control? Another consideration is if the tumor is so big that it's causing an obstruction, the bowel before that is going to be big and dilated. So that is a consideration because maybe we can't do the surgery the normal way we like to do with laparoscopy or robotic surgery or minimally invasive surgery. We might have to do a big open surgery because the bowel is so thick and big. Um, so these are all kinds of things we need to think about and also the, how healthy the patient is to begin with. We might need to get a cardiologist to see them, for example. So lots of thought and, um, and you know, time needs to be spent to, to make sure the patient is in their best possible condition. So in terms of the types of surgery we, we can do on the colon, we can take out the part of the colon that's affected. So in our particular situation, the sigmoid colon is affected. So that's this kind of bottom left square. So this is the part of the colon we're aiming to take out. And then we want to reconnect the old colon uh, to the rectum or the top to the top of this, uh, you know, part that we took out here. All right, and um, as you can imagine, the blood supply is an important feature of this, right? Because we have to make sure that we take the blood supply high enough to include all the lymph nodes that like to live around the blood supply, because that's gonna be part of our sampling and ensuring that we get good control of the tumor. But we have to also make sure that the bowel is not killed. The good bowel we're gonna use is not killed because we took the blood supply. So this is why knowing the anatomy and understanding that is super important. So has anyone heard of or seen robotic surgery before? All right, I'm gonna take that as a no since I got no responses, but um, okay, so robotic surgery is, is basically one of the reasons I loved colorectal and why I chose this specialty because this is really the bread and butter, the basics of how we operate in elective situations like this. They're not really in emergent situations, but um, this involves the, the operating surgeons sit at a console here and the robot is at the bedside with small instruments that go through small holes in the belly. So the insult to the patient is much less because all the work is done on the inside as opposed to doing a big open incision where the work you know, is done on the outside and then they have a lot of pain, risk of hernia, risk of wound infection, all these things. So this is sort of a robotic setup just to give you an idea. And just to kind of put that in perspective, you have the surgeon sitting at a console, the patient with a nurse or assistant at the bedside and tiny instruments coming into the patient's abdominal wall like this. And this is what it looks like once it's inside the body. So you can see there's just tiny little holes and we're doing all this work basically um, through these tiny holes and instruments. And this is similar to laparoscopic surgery if you've heard of that, but it allows a little bit more precision and better um, optics. The, the technology is better so we can see things much more clearly. So again, you can see the area of the colon we're trying to take out over here, the sigmoid colon, and then we're gonna reconnect the two ends. Um, so how do we reconnect the ends, right? If you think about colon surgery, I, I like to keep it simple. So let's think about it as a pipe, like plumbing. You have a you know clog in the pipe, which is our tumor. So we're gonna cut above that, cut below that, and then connect the two edges, right? So the way we do that is with a stapler called an EEA stapler. So the one end of the stapler goes through the anus into the remaining, you know, part of the bowel that has been cut off. And then the other end goes through the, the top part of the bowel and we close the stapler and fire it and it makes this new connection and puts it back in continuity. So we have a lot of really cool technology in surgery. So I just wanted to show you an example. This is something I use today. We call this ICG or indocinine green um, fluorescence. So this is um, an example of how we can use this. So this is um, the ureter, if you've heard of that, is the tube that carries the urine from the bladder, or uh, from the kidney to the bladder. And it's always right in the area that we operate in as colorectal surgeons. And if you look at picture A, you can see you can't, to the untrained eye, right, it's really hard to see the ureter, you can't see it. And so you could easily injure it and that could cause a big complication for the patient. But by using ICG in our ureters, we can, you know, they light up like a Christmas tree, right? So which surgeon do you wanna be? The patient, the one operating on A or the one operating on B? I much rather know exactly where the ureters are, right? 
right? So that helps us kind of keep track of them and um, is some cool technology. And another fun thing we can do is we can actually give the ICG in the vein, IV, and then we can watch it perfuse the bowel and we can see after we take the blood vessels, like I showed you, what part of the bowel is perfused or what part of the bowel still has a good blood supply because that's where we want to cut it, right? We want to leave the well perfused or well blood supplied bowel. And so here you can see the green where it dies off is, is where we would need to make our cut there. Any questions about that? All right, so then we go on to staging our cancer. And, um, you know, this is, gets in a lot into the weeds. So I don't, the only thing I really want to take you to take away from the slide is how good the survival rate is for colorectal cancer. And that's where you can make a big difference as a surgeon and another reason I like this specialty. So um, stage one cancer, the five-year survival rate is more than 95%. So that's pretty cool, right? Because if we catch these cancers early on colonoscopy with surgery alone at five years, pretty much all the patients are you know, still alive and doing well. Um, so you have a big impact on people's lives you know, at this point as a colorectal surgeon. So in terms of trying to figure out the treatment after we take out this cancer and we've staged it, um, one resource we use is called a multidisciplinary tumor board. So this is when the surgeons meet with specialists from all other um, fields, so medical oncology, radiation oncology, radiologists, pathologists, social workers, nutritionists, everybody meets all together in one room to discuss each case um, as an individual. Because unfortunately, you know, things aren't always so black and white and so simple, and we have to talk about the, the patient in, in, you know, in respect to them. Them as an individual and what's best for them and if they need further treatment or chemotherapy and things like that. So we review the tumor characteristics, the you know, social situation of the patient, all the different factors that go into what kind of treatment the patient will need. And here's a picture of what the tumor might look like from the inside. This is just one example if we cut the bowel in half. And um, here you can see the blood supply. So this you know, vessel, you can kind of see this little bump here. And then this is the sigmoid colon. So the tumor would have been somewhere in here. Um, so that's important to take this blood supply because we have um, going in here the lymph nodes that we're going to need to sample. All right, so did I convince you guys yet? Anyone a colorectal convert <laughs> or surgery convert? Maybe one person? Okay. So, you know, people always ask why I chose this field and why I really like it is because it, um, you know, it, it you can still do general surgery if that's something you like. And it's just, you know, a little bit of additional training that allows you to um, to treat, um, you know, in a, in a highly effective way, some patients with a lot of complex conditions. So everything from the small bowel, again, all the way down to the colorectum, anus, and perianal situations. So um, the coolest thing about the field is really the variety and the fact that we get to use a lot of different techniques. So we use minimally invasive surgery like laparoscopy and, and the da Vinci robot, like I showed you, and we do endoscopy um, as well as traditional open surgery. Um, another thing I like about the field, like I mentioned, is being able to work in a multidisciplinary fashion with the GI doctors, the oncologists, and um, really having that team atmosphere. So colorectal, in my opinion, really has it all. And I think it's a great specialty um, for those of you interested in surgery. All right, so here are just a few pictures. So this is us at the robot. Um, this is doing a open case. Um, just so you can see some examples. Okay. So I'm gonna leave you with a little bit of advice. Um, so those of you interested in medicine, which I'm assuming is pretty much all of you in this, in this talk, um, I know this can be overwhelming and intimidating and really terrifying. And I can definitely remember being in your situation and just thinking, wow, there's just so far to go and how, how will this you know, ever happen? Um, but it's also exciting, inspiring and an unbelievable privilege. So you just have to remember that you deserve to be there and you have everything you need to succeed and just sort of take it step by step. So I have um, some advice that people sort of gave me along my path that I think may help you. So here are my five rules that I'm gonna leave you with. So rule number one is pay attention to everything. I can't tell you how many times I think about, you know, when I was in undergrad or when I was in med school and it was a subject I wasn't really that interested in and I kind of blew it off. Um, you know, you're there, take advantage of that opportunity to learn that information because you're not gonna get it back and the time is really going to fly and you're gonna realize you wish you paid more attention. Um, rule number two is to find mentors. So, you know, mentorship doesn't have to be in really a formal capacity. It doesn't have to be an assigned person. It doesn't even have to be the same person for all aspects of your life. You know, you can find different people for your personal aspirations and different people for your career aspirations. But the main thing is you don't want to waste time recreating the wheel and you don't want to do things that don't work. So you should find people who have been successful and learn from them and, you know, take it up a notch and do even better for yourself. So mentorship is unbelievably important. And just to give you a slight example, of that. Um, I currently 
came back to Florida to join um, to my current partner, who I trained with as a medical student and resident in Miami when I was in training. Um, and she had always been a mentor to me. And, you know, I had an opportunity to work with her and start a new practice. Um, so you never know, you know, that was 10 years ago. You never what's, know what's going to happen with people you meet along the way. So developing those relationships and that guidance is just unbelievably important. Um, rule number three is work a little harder than everyone else, but don't be competitive except for with yourself and don't expect to be recognized for it. This took me so long to learn. I can't even tell you how much that, you know, I wasted time comparing myself to my classmates or to, you know, other people competing for the same position as me. It is literally that, a complete waste of time, and it's not going to get you anywhere. So just remember, everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses. And if you just focus on, you know, yourself and, and improving, you know, on your own end and not worrying about what everyone else is doing, you will get a lot further. Uh, rule number four is be flexible. So this applies to everything, but in terms of being an undergrad and a med student, eventually, you know, the main thing is to kind of, um, you know, apply this to your study strategy. So if you always have studied a certain way, or you've always tried to, you know, do research a certain way or whatever it is, and it's really not working, or you're not getting the results you want, you need to kind of adapt. And, um, you know, that's kind of a human nature, right? We can adapt, we can do things differently and change the path that we're on. Um, you know, this also applies if you, you know, for sure think you're pre-med and then you divert to something else and take a few years off to do something else and want to end up back in the medical field. You know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. So you just have to be adaptable. And rule number five is keep your eye on the prize. Cause like we said, this is a long road. I showed you all the, you know, kind of steps to get there and even how grueling residency and training can be, but just keep your eye on the end game, which is, you know, eventually being able to be a surgeon, which is a huge, um, you know, opportunity and privilege to be able to help people or any kind of doctor really, um, or any healthcare field to really just be able to um, impact people's lives in that way. All right, so um, thank you all so much for listening. I hope I can gave you, you know, a little bit of glimpse about surgery and colorectal and maybe one of you will become a colorectal surgeon and I'll be so proud. Um, but if you are interested, um, I put my Instagram there. I would love to, you know, connect with you over Instagram. I was recently sharing a lot about um, colorectal cancer awareness month. So you can find me on there and learn some fun facts about screening and um, may help, you know, your family and friends who are 45, which is the screening age. Um, and, you know, any, as you move on in your uh, pre-med and uh, and medical school careers. I also have some advice on there that may help. So um, please feel free to be in touch if you have any questions. And I'm also happy to take any questions now if we have. If you guys have questions, you can post it in the chat or um, just unmute yourselves. All right, and then if you don't have any and you want to kind of talk more offline, you can always um, message me on, on Instagram. We can get in touch that way. Um, I do have a question. Can you like explain what your typical hours look like in a week? Yeah, so, you know, as an attending, you will be able to devise your schedule kind of how you want. So my schedule, just to run through it, Monday is like my sort of academic administrative day. So I'll sometimes add on cases or see patients in clinic if there's, you know, an emergency kind of situation. But mostly I do kind of administrative stuff or prepare my lectures for teaching the med students and the residents. Um, Tuesday, I have clinic. Wednesday is my OR day. Thursday, I also have clinic and then Friday is my OR day. So, you know, you can spread it out like that. So you have a little bit of, you know, flexibility. Um, of course, with surgery, emergencies come up. So that sounds all good in theory, but there's often clinic days where you're doing surgery and surgery days where you're doing clinic and, you know, things get mushed around. But um, in general, that's one thing I like about colorectal is there's a good balance between, you know, clinic and an operative day. So you're not getting kind of burnt out doing one or the other. Did you ever get like really overwhelmed with anything and how did you cope with that? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I think I cried like every single day of intern year of residency, you know, it, it is definitely overwhelming. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of that has to do with the stress, the competition on top of that being tired and hungry and all these other factors that are not leading to an ideal situation. But, um, you know, I think like, like I said, in the advice, the thing that really was the turning point for me, and it took, you know, pretty much 10 years into my training to, to get to that is just only worrying about myself, you know, stop comparing myself to everybody else, take that competition factor and feeling inferior and all that out of the picture. And once you just really focus on you and doing better, and you don't have that expectation to like compare yourself to everyone, that's really where you're able to, you know, 
reorient and, and get your priorities straight and focus on improving. But um, yeah, I think having outlets too, like for me, I was very lucky. I had, you know, a super supportive husband. I had my kids as something to look forward to when I got home, you know, other, for other people, it's, you know, running and whatever it is, you know, family, pets, you know, you definitely need to have an outlet in some way to, uh, to enjoy your very limited free time. <laughs> Um, let's see, I see someone with a question. What are things or habits that helped you stay on track and stay motivated throughout schooling and residency? Yeah, like I mentioned, I mean, when I, I was, I didn't get married till I was in residency, but in med school, mostly it was, you know, I would say I, you know, I really enjoyed like working out, um, doing outdoor kind of stuff, having, um, I really like to make schedules. So that made me feel like accomplished. You know, I would know what I had to study during the, you know, for that week, for example, and I would put it on paper, write it out, check it off, like having those like goals and a to-do list and a task list really helped. Um, but I definitely think you need to schedule in, you know, relaxation time um, and, and you know, try to have, for example, if you have a, you know, big test, you know, you'll say, okay, I'm going to study four hours and I'm going to take a break for lunch and then I'm going to study three hours and then I'm going to work out and then I'm going to study two more hours and then I'm going to, you know, go have dinner. Like you have to just make a plan and then you'll feel less stressed and more organized that you're meeting those little, you know, short-term goals. Anyone else has a question? Okay. So then I guess we can close the session. Um, thank you so much for the incredible and insightful session, Dr. Ray. I really enjoyed how interactive and encouraging you were. And I hope to have a session with you again in the future. Um, if you you have your social media up there, so you can, anyone who wants to follow that can get that at um, and follow her on Instagram. To our Wayne State students, please make sure you complete the Google survey. It will be posted in the Zoom chat summarizing the session to obtain your shadow hours. And thank you all. Um, I hope you have a good rest of your day and enjoy your weekend. Have a good weekend, guys. The survey link should be sent right now. It's right there.